Um, as you know, we always start. <coughs> Excuse me. Got a little bit of a cough. My allergies are off the rails, so just bear with me. And for anyone who's wondering, yes, I am on medication, but it's just not working yet. Or at all. Yeah, it's not COVID. So, so if you could, everyone, if you want to open up the Coptic Reader, we're going to do the prayer of thanksgiving along with Psalm 50. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Let us give thanks to the beneficent and merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. For he has covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to himself, spared us, supported us, and has brought us this hour. To guard us in all peace, this holy day, and all the days of our life. O Master, Lord, God, the Pontificator, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for everything concerning everything and in everything. For you have covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to yourself, spared us, supported us, and has brought us to this hour. Therefore, we ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, grant us to complete this holy day and all the days of our life in all peace with your fear, all envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan, the counsel of wicked men, and the rising up of enemies, hidden and manifest. Take them away from us and from all your people and from this holy place. But those things which are good and profitable do provide for us. For it is you who have given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon all power of the enemy. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through the grace, compassion, love of mankind. Our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom the glory, the honor, the dominion, and the worship are due unto you. With him and the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, who is one essence with you. At all times and to ages of all ages, amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your according to the multitude your kingdom. Blot out my iniquity, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my iniquities, my sin is at all times before me. Against you only have I sinned and done evil before you, that you might be found just in your sayings, and I overcome when you are judged. For behold, I was conceived in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Again, before behold, you have loved the truth. You have manifested to me the hidden and unrevealed things of your wisdom. You shall sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be purified. You shall wash me, and I shall not be made whiter than snow. You shall make me hear gladness and joy, and the humble bones shall rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and who will I fear in my inward parts? Do not cast me away from your face, and do not remove your spirit from me. Do me the joy of your salvation. You shall teach transgressors your ways, that ungodly men shall turn to you. Deliver me from blood, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall rejoice in your righteousness. O Lord, you shall open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. For if you desire sacrifice, I would have given it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God is a broken spirit, a broken and humbled heart. Do good, O Lord, and your good pleasure to Zion, and let the walls of Jerusalem be built. Then ye shall be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness, offerings, and burnt sacrifices. Then ye shall offer. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity that we may gather back into your church, Lord. I thank you because the doors of your church are always welcome to us, Lord. They're always open to us, welcoming us, Lord, no matter our current state. But Lord, we thank you for receiving us today, Lord. And Lord, we stand before you and we come and we search for a message, Lord. We, we ask that you just open our eyes. Lord, I ask that you just, that you fertilize the soil that's inside of our hearts, Lord, for that when the seed is given, Lord, that it may take root and bear fruit, Lord. For Lord, I ask that you just fill this upper room with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that, that someone can actually take away something tangible and applicable into their life today, Lord. This might not just be a clinging symbol, Lord, but something that will actually bear fruit. So I ask that you just make us attentive, Lord. I ask that you give us a message, Lord. I ask that your presence be real, Lord. Not just in this upper room, Lord. Not just in this church, Lord. But every single day outside of these walls as well. I ask that our lives will become pleasing to you, Lord. And I ask that you have mercy in our sins, Lord. And that you hear our prayers in the session of our saints and our tears. Here is when we pray in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> mm. 
Christ is risen. Truly, is risen. Truly he is risen. All right, Claudio, set up whatever you need to set up. You look like a man on a mission right now. All right, so I'm going to tell you guys there's something that I do every single year about this time of the year, and it always, I always do it right after the resurrection because I will tell you, if I had to ask you guys, and you guys can just throw in answers, right? When do you think the hardest time in the church is? During the fast. During the fast, what else? You said after the fast. After the fast. So actually, yeah, I'm with Pete. Like, I think the hardest time in the church is a holy 50 days. And what I mean like the hardest time in the church, I don't mean like it's hard, like, you know, like we don't like it or this and like, no, like the church is beautiful. You walk into the church, it's clearly like all, you know, decorated in white, you know, we have joyous hymns and all of that stuff's great. But when I say it's the hardest time in the church, I think it's the hardest time in the church to actually grow. And to be honest with you, if we even look at like attendance in the church and, and by the grace of God, our church was very full today. Um, but I think it's, it's, we start seeing a downturn in attendance globally, right? Um, I also think we call it the holy 50 days, but in reality, if we looked at the last couple weeks of your life, and at least in my life as well, it's more of like the holy 50 days of gluttony. And when, I'm, when I talk about like the gluttony, I'm not just talking about us like fully indulging in all of the food that we missed. Um, we've had some great gatherings and we've had some great food. I remember, you know, the Thursday night after the men's, like, you know, we always break it with like a bunch of meat and we had so much food there and we did so much indulging there and it was great. Um, but I'll be honest with you. I wish it was just that we were indulging in food because I think if we were honest with ourselves, we might be laxing up in other areas of our life as well. And... I think once we celebrate the feast and we kind of take our foot off of, you know, the gas pedal a little bit, I think we start to see a lot of sin start creeping in too, where we were like really, really good about backing out a lot of stuff during the fast. But now that the fast is over, we've let all of our guards down when it comes to food, when it comes to other things as well. And one of the stories I always look to and I always read it after the fast um, the fast of the, of the resurrection. And I'm sure I've spoken it in here too, because I know it's something that's really close to my, to my heart. It's a story that's found in the gospel according to St. John 21. And, um, I think it's a story that we, we're all familiar with, but I'm just going to read, the, you know, 21 verse two. And it says, Simon Peter, Thomas, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana, in, um, in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the other and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we are, gonna, we are going with you also. And they went out immediately, got in their boats, and that night they caught nothing. And I, I love that story. I think it's a great story for every single one of us to think about after the fast of the resurrection. And I think there's a lot of deep truths to this. Because I think a lot of times we look at the stories in this Bible and we think that's a very, very nice story. But we forget the fact that these are words of life. And not only are they words of life, they are words of, like, to our life. And there's a lot of parallels that we see that are going on in this Bible that if we were able to apply them to our lives, I think we would live a lot differently. Because I think it's very ironic that where do they go? They went fishing, right? Guys, that was a layup. If you guys, oh, I, I need a little bit more interaction. So if I give you guys a layup like that, I think you, you guys just got to go with it, right? But they went fishing, right? And I think that there's so much insight to fishing. For, for St. Peter, he was fishing. Okay, and I want you to remember that, right? But what was St. Peter doing, you know, because that was what he did BC, like before Christ called him, he was a fisherman. And that's what he was doing. And to be honest with you, he was doing it for the last three and a half years, like, or he wasn't doing it for the last three and a half years. He left it. And not only did he leave it, how did he spend his last three and a half years? Yeah, he was following Christ daily, right? He was with him. Not only was he a part of the entourage, he was part of like the inner circle, right? He followed him everywhere. And, and to think about it, St. Peter had a lot of great firsts, right? He was, he was the first one to walk on water when Christ kind of like, you know, called him out. Right? He was the first one to confess that Christ was the Messiah. And St. Peter had all of these great firsts, right? He told them, like, you know, you, on, on this truth, I will build your church, right? Like, all of these great things. But although he had these great firsts, 
he also was the first to go back fishing. It was his idea. And, um, you know, you think about that and you're like, well, what's the relevance of, of St. Peter here shortly after, right? Like we're talking like real shortly, like a couple days later, you know, who basically said, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to go fishing again, right? And I think when we look at St. Peter, that might not make sense to us, right? But when you think about what fishing was to him, so it was what he was used to. What did you say, Michael? It was easy. Yeah, it was easy. It was what he was used to. It's where he found comfort. Right? It was kind of like his go-to. It's how he provided for himself. It was all, it was really, to be honest with you, it was his old way of life, wasn't it? And I think if we start thinking about that, right, it should hit close to home for, you know, every single one of us here. Because what happened is after the resurrection, St. Peter went right back to his old lifestyle. He went right back to what was comfortable for him. And the thing I love about St. Peter is St. Peter does some stuff, like specifically in the Gospels, right? Because, you know, in the, in the book of Acts, God does amazing things through St. Peter, right? But specifically in the Gospels, like you'll see Peter and he'll do something and you'll almost kind of be in disbelief and you'll kind of want to point at him and laugh at him and just be like, who is this guy, right? But in every one of those situations, when we point at him and we laugh at him, we say, who is this guy? That guy is us. And I think that's what I love about the character of St. Peter, because every single time he does that, you can sit there and you think to yourself, yeah, I do that too. Like, I do that too more than I like to admit. And although I love it, like, I love to laugh at St. Peter when he does it, whenever I do it, I justify it. And I've got great reasons on why it's okay for me, right? But I'm going to tell you, right, so before I actually get into the, into the message for us today, I want to ask you guys, you know, an important question. And I love it, right, because... John 20, 15, okay, just the, the chapter right before that, we know that, that the, the tomb was empty, okay, and, and one of the Marys went to the tomb looking for Christ's body, um, and Christ's standing there, you know, and, and she doesn't realize it's Christ, he asks her a million dollar question, right? Does anyone know this, one, this one's extra credit, right? Does anyone, does anyone remember the question that Christ asks one of the St. Mary's? Not the one I was thinking about. But yeah, I think he does ask that as well. But he says, whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? And I thought like that in itself is such a beautiful question, right? Like, whom do you seek? Whom do you, whom do you seek? And in the holy 50 days, right, you're going to start seeing that life, you know, we always joke around because it's really hard to be Coptic Orthodox in the holy 50 days because every weekend you either have a wedding, an engagement, a birthday party, a graduation, a this and this and this and this and this, right? And we start seeing all of, our, all of our priorities on the holy 50 days get totally skewed, right? Where we should be celebrating like the resurrection of Christ, right? We should be celebrating the power of the resurrection that's available to all of us to overcome the sin in our lives, right? Um, but instead, what, what do we end up doing, right? We end up, we start going to church less because we got all of this other stuff that we're doing, right? And it's almost like we, our spiritual tanks are overflowing from, from like the fast that we basically say, oh man, I'm overflowing here. I built up a nice reservoir. So now I'm just going to kind of like, I'm going to coast it, right? I'm going I'm to live off of the spirituality of like the great fast. And, um, and, but I think if we were honest, we are not living in a position of, of overflow anymore. I think if we were honest with ourselves, we start realizing that we're actually getting very spiritually cold. But we still show up, right? I commend you guys. You guys made, you know, the, the 15 flights of steps upstairs, you know, to come to the Bible study. But I think, like, the big question here is, like, you know, when, when the resurrection's over, when the, when the feast is over, right, and then we're back here, what's our life look like? And then when I ask you, what does your life look like? I'm going to follow it up with that same question. Whom do you seek? A couple of weeks ago, I know who we all were seeking, but are we still seeking him today? Right? Like, why are we here? Are we here because it's what we do on Sunday mornings? You know, are we here because we love the people here? Are we here, you know, for, you know, the power of the resurrection that was offered to every single one of us? Are we here because truly he is worthy of all of our worship and all of our praise? Right? Are we here because this is where we meet our friends? Right? Like, we have to, we have to be honest with our questions. Right? So the question for us to think about today and every single time I read this chapter 
is have we gone back to our old style of life after the fast? Have we fallen right back into our same patterns? And I hope not. But in reality, I know that many of us have, myself included, right? And I know a lot of us, you know, when we think about it, we don't want to go back to where we were. We look back at the fast and the fast was a beautiful time and we enjoyed it and we loved it, right? But when we take our eyes off of it, right? And we realize just like St. Peter, we find ourselves going right back to what's comfortable, right? So how could St. Peter do that after three and a half years? How could he just forget about everything he had seen? How could he forget that he saw miracles after miracles after miracles at the hand of Christ? How could he forget when the disciples were sent out two by two? He was the one who was actually in part, you know, creating these miracles as well. He was doing them. How can he forget all that he had seen? All, how about all that he had promised? Matthew 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. John 6, 68, but Simon Peter answered and said, to Lord, whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. John 13, 9, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head also. Matthew 26, 35, it says, even if, you have to, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you, right? All of these, you know, think about all of these big statements and these big promises that St. Peter made, right? And here we are, not even three days later, and he goes right back to fishing, like right back to fishing. And the more I think about it, the more it breaks my heart, right? How can someone who was so on fire for Christ, you know, go back to living his life like that last three and a half years has never happened? Right? Well, went right back to what he thought. And it hits home, like I said, because when we, when we identify where we are in this story, we realize that we do the same exact thing, right? Just a couple weeks ago, right? You think about it. How many times did you come to church midweek, for Holy Week, right? We all prayed hundreds, if not thousands, of Thok Teti Goms, right? Thine is the power, the glory, the blessing, the majesty forever, right? The Lord is my strength, my praise. He has become my salvation, right? Right? And then if you were, you know, if you showed up on Good Friday, Good Friday is like the longest day, like in church history, right? Every hour on the hour, we've got four different gospels, right? At the end of every hour, we do all the litanies, which are a lot, but we don't mind it. Like we're, like, we're like all in. And I look at the way that we lived that week, right? How dialed in we were that week, how connected we felt that week. And then you fast forward like a week or two and you start realizing it's a totally different picture, right? And we always go back and everyone has great memories and great thoughts of like Holy Week, right? And they say, man, how do I get that back? Like, how do I, how do I experience God as close as he was during Holy Week? And the thing it, I, I, I truly, I believe is because we're living out Colossians 3, 2, where it says, set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. And I think that's the difference for that week. We are so focused, right? We're so focused. Like it, it takes almost like all of us, but you think about that week, most of us, we still go to work. We still have jobs. We still have families. We still do all of those other things, but we make a precedence. We make time for it, right? To set our mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth, right? And then here's the thing, right? He desires that intimacy with us and he wants it to last longer than a week. Like he loves what we pour out during Holy Week. He just wishes that it would continue more. So here's a question for, for St. Peter or about St. Peter is why did he go fishing again? Right? Why did he go fishing? Like in Luke 5, Christ called him away from that. He told him, he's like, you're not going to be a fisherman anymore, but I will make you a fisher of men. He gave him a new profession. Why would he return back to the same things that he did before he ever came into contact with Christ? And I'll be honest with you, I think it's because he had no idea what else to do. He didn't know what else to do. You know, you think about it, you put yourself in his shoes, right? You know, the one who boldly proclaimed Christ in front of the 11, the other 11, right? He says, if, if these guys all deny you, I will never deny you. You know, and he basically said, if you're willing to die, like if you have to go die, like I'll go die with you, right? And the thing is, is those were really, really big words. Um, but I remember a time I was talking with one of the youth um, and this was a guy who was like really, really far from the church. And I remember it was Holy Week and, and the guy 
not only did he show up like once or twice like this, this youth showed up like every day in Holy Week, right? And he was just talking about how like, man, he missed this, right? And he needed to change his life and he needed to make different decisions. And he knew that at, at, in the church is where he felt home. And he needed to stop hanging around bad friends and bad relationships. He was going to give everything a new start, you know, him and Christ and, he, and things were going to change. Pete, total 180, pure repentance. And I was like, man, that's awesome, right? But then Monday came and I called him I got his voicemail. Tuesday came, I texted him and I got ghosted, right? And I'm starting to think, okay, well, you know, what, what happened? What happened? And I think there's this question, right? And I think this was a question that was on St. Peter's mind after Christ, you know, was crucified and buried. And the question sounded a lot like, so now what? So now what? You know, for three and a half years, his so now what was just follow Christ, right? Follow the big guy, whatever. When Christ woke up and he said, we're going here, <laughs> he went there. When Christ said, I'm going over there, he's going to say, I'm going over there. You know, get on the boat. He was getting on the boat. So at that point, right, um, he just followed. But this was the first time in St. Peter's life where he needed to learn on what to do on his own. And I think that that was a very, very big game changer for him, right? Because a part of me thinks that maybe St. Peter forgot about the promises that Christ had made to him, right? Because if St. Peter would remember that, he would have realized that that was not the end of the story, right? He told St. Peter, and also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. He knew that Christ had a plan. He knew that the story wasn't over, but what was the problem? The problem is sometimes we make decisions of our own thinking, not thinking about what God himself has promised us. Because in our own minds, we've already decided that this is a pretty good decision, right? A matter of fact, if we are honest with ourselves, we will choose decisions because they are actually easier decisions. And I think for St. Peter to go back fishing was the easier decision. But we also have to remember that we were commanded in 1 Corinthians 5.7, it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. There has to be an aspect of faith when we're making these decisions, which means it's not always going to be the easy decision. There's going to be challenging stuff out there. And I think there's a lot of us in this room, right, where Holy Week was great. The fast was great. And, but the reality of it is, to benefit from Holy Week, 80 to 90% of it is just showing up. What do we do? We walk in here, right? I remember the good old days, you had to have a book. Now you don't even have a book. You just need to have your cell phone. Turn on the Light and Life app right? And you just sit there and you just kind of enjoy it, right? They have, you know, we're, we're led in everything. We're read in the readings. We're read in the, in the folk teti gomes. You know, you got someone who's going to give you a nice sermon at the end of the night. Um, to be honest with you, you don't even have to read. They will read to you. You just have to listen. And it's a beautiful thing, right? Because during Holy Week, there was so much structure, we had a place to go. We had a system. We were surrounded by a bunch of people that were doing, they were doing it with us. So we had the support system around us too, right? But guess what? The days of full service have come to an end. It all ended on a daily, like on the daily when we celebrated that Feast of the Resurrection. And I think at this point, you've had two weeks on your own. How are you doing? How are you doing? Right? And I, and I will tell you that that is one of those things where, where I believe um, that's where St. Peter lost it. When he was woken up and he knew that it was on him and he was asking himself, so now what? Now I'll tell you St. Peter for me is a very personal Bible story. A lot of it, I don't know if it's because I was named after him, but I feel like it took a lot of his characteristics that nobody wants. Like I didn't get the good stuff. I got like the bad stuff um, and his weaknesses. But I will tell you that I love it because when you read stories and you see weakness and you can relate to it, it's a beautiful thing. Because a lot of the times we get confused. If we're not in our Bibles, we think that this story, like this book, is full of stories that had it all together. But this was a story, like this whole book is full of stories where people were broken. They had their issues. They were working through some stuff but God was still willing to use them, right? 
And I love this because sometimes you'll read something and you're like, yeah, I do that, right? And the thing in this story um, with the similarity is that I was just like, yeah, I can see how that would definitely happen. Um, is when he decided to make a bad decision, was the bad decision isolated to him? His bad decision stumbled all of those around him as well. And stupidity loves company. And I'm going to tell you, one man's, one man's decision, just one man, right? Single-handedly brought down 64% of the disciples, if you think about that. Seven of the 11 disciples, when he made a bad decision, said, you know what, we're going to come with you. And if you're honest with yourself, are there aspects of your life where your stupidity brings down those around you? Where other people are paying the price for your bad ideas? And I have to tell you something. There's a huge power in numbers. And I'm going to tell you the same way that that could be a great thing. It could be a positive thing. I'm going to tell you the same way it could be a very, very negative thing. And this is how a church should function. Like I alluded to last, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago during Holy Week, it was beautiful to have the whole church together during the week, praising and praying and thok teti goming and listening to the spiritual encouragements of the sermon and the expositions and, and everything. And that is the way that a church should function. I love it on Thursday nights when it comes to the men and the men get together and we lift each other up and we hold each other accountable and it's great things and a positive momentum and it's beautiful. That's exactly how it should work. That's how a church should function. But I'm going to tell you, be careful because it also works the other way too. And who you surround yourself will definitely have a, uh, an impact on you. And I wish that all of our, the people that we're allowing into our lives had this positive fo force on us. But in reality, even when it came to the disciples, St. Peter took down half of them. Just by himself. So I'm going to tell you, be careful who you keep friends with. Now, does that mean only have perfect friends? No, that will never happen. And St. Peter was a pretty stand-up guy. He made, a, he made a bad decision. But I'm going to tell you that there's some of us in this room where we have friendships with people who are not stand-up individuals at all. The best quote I ever heard is, you are the average of your five closest friends. So think about that. If you are not who you want to be, who are you surrounding yourself with? Because you are the average of your five closest friends. So at that time, Give me one second. I'm going to skip that part. I'm going to skip actually the first, first Corinthians 118. And I love this because it's something that I always want to remember because one of the, feel, the things I always feel about there is in the church is there's a little bit of like a disconnect. We all hear about the power of the cross, right? We all hear about when you, when you read in Romans, right? It talks about that the same power of the resurrection is available for every single one of us. But a lot of the times we feel like there's some type of disconnect and I don't, I don't have that in my life, right? And I love this because in 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And I, when I read that verse, that answers my, so now what? So now what, right? My thing is, is the power of the cross, the power of our own death, the thing that everybody else around us will make fun of us and ridicule us on. That is where we find power. A thing that blows my mind is you get St. Paul, who St. Paul in his writings is talking about the fact, he says, I will boast in my weakness, in my weakness, because that's where God shows up. That's where his power sustains me. And at the same time, is that the way that we're wired to live now according to society standards? Never. There's no weakness. We can't show off our weakness. Right? What do we do? Society tells us, be proud. Walk, you know, pick your head up. Stand up firm. Only show people your best side. Best foot forward, right? Tight handshake. All of this other stuff. But St. Paul basically says, no, man, like, I cracked the code. None of that's true. Where's my power? And power's in the cross. What's the cross? Cross is death. So I have to die to myself. Right? I have to die to myself. I have to die to others. I have to esteem others higher than I esteem myself. And that's where I'm going to get power? 100%. And I love that because I'm going to tell you guys that that's what we should be seeing in the church right now. Right? Look, there's going to be every, every part of us that wants us to go back to our old nature and go back to what's comfortable. 
Go back to what feels good. But at the same time, what St. Paul's telling us, he says, you can't do that. You've got to go back to the cross. The cross is where it's at. You can't stay in your old nature. We have to be moving forward and growing. But I'm going to challenge you guys that where are you going to go from now? Where to now? Right? Because something happened on the cross. Something happened because on the cross, Christ overcame death. And it was the first time that we ever saw the power of the resurrection. And I'm going to ask you guys, do you guys want to have that power in your life? Are you done being bound by chains of some of the stuff that's holding you back? Because if you look at your life, are you happy fishing? Because I'm going to tell you when I look at the story of St. Peter again, I saw something else that said that happens to me all of the time, where I'll try to go back to my prior way of life. I'll try to go back fishing. I'll try to go back to the things that made me comfortable, the things that I thought were going to make me happy. And at the end of the night, I love it because in 20, John 21, 3, it says they went out immediately. They got into their boat and that night they caught nothing. They caught nothing. And I'm going to tell you, every single time I try to go back fishing, I catch nothing as well. Nor will we ever find anything like that. I have a feeling there are a lot of us here who, if we are not fishing, we have not gone back fishing, we at least have the desire to go back fishing. But we, we will catch nothing. That is the guarantee. And the love of Christ used that horrible decision. And I love this because even though St. Peter made a big mistake by going fishing again, Christ used that big mistake to show up in a really big way in his life. And even though who was pursuing who in this story, right? St. Peter went out to go fish. He was going back to his old lifestyle to the things that were comfortable, right? And at that point, if I was God, I would have said, leave him. Leave him. Leave him to his bad decisions. Leave him to whatever he wants to do. You know what? Let him go learn his lesson. Let him go learn his lesson, but that's not the type of God that we have. The type of God that we had, he went and he met him on the shore. Not only did he meet him on the shore, but with such compassion and such love, right? Who pursued who that morning, right? Who pursued who? And the good news is that when Christ was waiting on that shore, he was waiting for St. Peter. Not only was he waiting for St. Peter, he had a beautiful plan for St. Peter. In the same way that he was waiting for St. Peter, every single time when we're going in our own direction, it might not be what God wants us to do, is that he's waiting for every single one of us as well. And he's calling us and he has a plan for us as well. And he knew that St. Peter had made some serious mistakes, uh, mistakes recently. This is before he restored him after the denial, right? He knew that he denied him, but it didn't change the way that Christ felt about St. Peter. It didn't erase any of the promises. It didn't erase his calling. It did not erase his purpose. But the huge thing is, is we see what happens in St. Peter's life when he finds the power of the resurrection. And I'm going to tell you guys as well, I know that we've all made mistakes. And I know that we've blown it more, more times. I know that we have unkept promises to God. A lot of those promises might have even just been two weeks ago while we were standing here in Holy Week. But just because we broke those promises, it doesn't change the way that he feels about us. It doesn't change the plan he has for you. It doesn't change the fact that he's on the shore waiting for you. And he's calling for you. So today he's waiting for every single one of us. He wants to have intimacy with us. He wants to pick up exactly where he left off. He wants us to have power. And I'm going to encourage you guys. Look, I'm not saying that, hey, go brush off your Pesca week uh, book and pray it for the coming week. But what I'm going to tell you is, can you carve out time to get in your word? Right? Every single day, chapter a day. Is that, is that unreasonable? We were giving way more time than that in Pesca. Can we get in our Bible every day? Chapter a day right? Can we stand up? Can we pray in the morning, at night? And I'm not talking about huge, long, drawn out prayers. Offer what you can, right? But there's a certain point where we have plenty of now what's. We know what to do, but the question is, is will, you, will we be faithful in actually doing that? Amen? Right, let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Dear Lord, so compassionate, so loving, so forgiving, Lord. We thank you, Lord, and I don't even know what to stay while, say while I stand before you, Lord, because truly you keep looking past our failures, our decisions, the places we go for fulfillment, the places that we go to find comfort, Lord. 
But Lord, you keep calling us back to yourself, even though we are not worthy of it. We don't, we don't deserve it. A lot of the times, Lord, I'll be honest with you, we don't even know how to respond to it. But Lord, when we see you, that's, it's the only thing that we want. So Lord, I humbly ask you this week that when we come into your presence, Lord, that you just show up the same way you showed up on that shore. Lord, I ask that you show up to every single one of us here, Lord, because we know that it is only in your presence that we desire even more of your presence, Lord. Because it's so easy to get distracted in this world that we're living in, Lord. But I ask that we just set our eyes on you, that we remember that you are the only one that's satisfied. You're the only one that can give us life and that you, that you give it more abundantly. So Lord, I ask that you just that you wrestle with hearts this week, Lord, and that you bring us into your presence so that we can just share that intimacy with you. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord. I ask that you forgive us. And that you hear these prayers lift in the session of all your saints and martyrs. Here's we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, public service announcement. So, do you guys remember that we were, we were doing this thing where the first month, the first Sunday of every month, we would do it like a, a church potluck up here? Remember, we, we announced it, and then we would send out an email, and then no one would sign up for it, and then everyone would come upstairs and be like, are we doing a meeting today? We'd be like, no, today's a fellowship, you know, fellowship Sunday. And then it would be like, oh, is that today? And then like, we wouldn't have enough food because all the kids would come up and eat it before any of the adults even got here. So we need to decide. Do we want to try to make this Fellowship Sunday thing work on the first Sunday of every month? Raise your hand because everyone's nodding but no one's committing. Okay, so in that case, on the church email that's going to come out this week, there's going to be a sign-up sheet. Can you guys sign up to bring something? Is it reasonable? Okay. Now, I also think that it's a great opportunity because look, have we grown as a church? Yeah. Yes. yes. Do we all know probably three, four, five different families that are not upstairs right now that are probably, that they do attend our church? Yes. The key to a good church is people getting like tied into it and having fellowship and having community. So can you tell them about the potluck too? And you can try it so we can all try to get to know each other and get to be friends so that we can actually be a church of like fellowship and communion? Okay, so when you get that email, sign up for something, call your friends that also go to this church and encourage them to sign up for something. Yes? All right, cool. Thank you. You, you can make two if you like. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Valerie. I'm on the fundraising committee, and I just wanted to make an announcement. We're going to have a fundraiser that's coming up in a few months. It's not right now, but we're going to plant the seeds for quite a while before it starts. So um, it basically involves whatever you do for work. So if you have a service or if you sell a product and you would like to donate, for example, an hour of your time to the church, someone else in the church would pay for that time and the funds would go to the building fund. And so if you have something that you can offer, um, if you have a college student or a high school student and they would like to donate, for example, an evening of babysitting, someone else in the church would pay for that time and then that, that student would donate the time. Um, we're going to roll it out probably in July. However, it will take some lead time, right, to get all the information from people who are able to donate, whatever. Um, I do real estate investing, and I have an investing company, and so I'm going to donate consulting time. So um, it will take some time logistically to manage all of it. But if you have anything, feel free to reach out to myself or to Rita Gindi, and um, we'll start working on all that. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you.